we are live on the Frugal Crafter YouTube channel. I'm Lindsay, the Frugal Crafter, along with Sarah. Hi! And we are going to sketch and do some quick kind of sketches and watercolors of pumpkins and gourds because it's that time of year. Oh, I haven't seen them at the grocery store yet, the pumpkins and gourds. Oh, it's only a matter of time. Yeah, I'm a... pretending it's not happening. And the harvest... To... Oh, I love the gourds, though. I, love I do, too, but I'm, still, I'm holding on to summer as long as possible. Yeah, that's true. I, I am a summer girl. I like the summer. <laughs> I'm going to be sketching with some water-soluble um, pencils. I like these because I have a bunch of different brands here, but um, I like them because they're all media. Like, it's all... There's a little wrapper on it to keep your hands clean, but, like, you pay for a crayon or a pencil, and it's all usable, so you're not going to sharpen away wood or anything. It's all, like, pigment. You could use a regular watercolor pencil, though. Um, I just wanted to put my two cents in why I like these. And um, we're just going to jump right into it. I'm going to start off with a basic, um, a basic pumpkin. So a basic pumpkin can be either kind of oblong shape like that. And, I'm use and you can be real sketchy with your watercolor pencils because you can um, make the, the lines kind of dissolve. And I'm drawing pretty dark so you can see. Or it can, they can be round. I'm drawing from the shoulder, so my whole um, my whole arm is moving. You can't see it on camera, but it's a great way to get a good rounded shape is to use your whole arm. Or it could be kind of like an oval. So I'm drawing really light, and then I'll just draw the lines I want to see darker. By the way, if you have any questions as we go along, like you want to see a particular type of gourd, if I know how to draw it, I will um, sketch it for you. Just type the word QUESTION in all caps, and um, then Sarah will let me know. If you have a watercolor question, watercolor crayon question, watercolor pencil color, uh, question, um, sketching question, you can pop that in the chat as well with the word QUESTION in all caps, and your question upper and lower case is normal, and the mods will help you, or Sarah will relay it to me. And then each of our pumpkins would have a little stem, so your stem could be just kind of like a curved uh, rectangle. You could do um, a longer stem that's kind of like a funnel if you want. Sometimes pumpkins have stems like that. Or it could just like a little stump. Now on your pumpkins, you'll generally notice that some pumpkins can be smooth. We'll make this one a smooth one. And you really wouldn't see a lot of texture. Um, but often, like especially if you have like the fairy tale pumpkins or the Cinderella pumpkins, you're gonna have these um, kind of uh, parallel lines that are kind of like how lines on a globe. These ribs here, and you'll notice as they're as you're looking at the front of a pumpkin, they're gonna be pretty straight. And as they get towards more towards an edge, they're going to mimic um, or curve towards the edge that they are going towards. Now this uh, video was by request uh, from a couple people. I had kind of a crabby little sketchbook Sunday on Sunday, if any of you guys caught that. I was kind of in a cranky, not really in a cranky mood, but I just could not get the inspiration going. And I did a very fast uh, video and I wasn't happy with my sketch, and but it had, I couldn't think of anything better to do. And um, But it was a pumpkin and it was drawn very quickly and, and people said they would like to see a little bit more detail there. So. Um, I thought I would do gourds and pumpkins today. And then this one, you can also have those very like uh, light ribs on your pumpkin without there being a lot of bumps or texture. And they can be, um, you can have actually some di differences in color going up the ribs, such as like an orange pumpkin, but you could have some green going up on those ribs. And you see that a lot more in gourds. And like this one would be super, super light. Now, as far as coloring, generally, um, your like in the ribs, especially if you have the the deeper ones, they're going to have more shadow, and then the front of the pumpkins is going to be brighter, and also it could be the tops too, because sun usually comes down from the top. And generally, if you're taking a, a photo, you would have the sun behind you, so the front of your subject would be lit up, uh, lighted up. I feel like I can't talk like in actual English today. Or any other language, so. <laughs> oh, my word. So I'm just putting in some yellow for highlight. This is the Arteza uh, watercolor, crayon, uh, full stick watercolor pencils. Those are really nice as well. Um, I really like the Derwent Aquatone, but they're discontinued. You can't, you might be able to find some older stock, but I was looking recently and they were, it was so expensive. People had like jacked up the prices crazy because, mm. you know, 
there's just out there what there is. So I don't think they're worth paying a lot of money for, but you know, if you got a decent, if you could find a used set that wasn't crazy, then go for it. But you know, I wouldn't pay like $10 a crayon for them or anything. Doing a little bit of this, um, this is a raw umber here at the bottom of the pumpkins, not too dark. And we can put some of that in stem. So that, cause the stems usually are not bright. They're usually like anywhere between um, like a deep hunter to a, a yellow ochre color. They're, they're definitely more muted. And I heard these pencils were discontinued. I actually uh, bought some open stock ones, my favorite color and finished up my set. They only made 24. I had a set of 12 and I really liked them. So I got a few extra. And let's look first, maybe darker red here, maybe this deep vermilion, we can do a little bit of that in the, in the ribs. And then we're going to add some water because it's fun to see the water go on these. I wonder if anyone's sketching along. You can always pause the replay afterwards if you uh, want to sketch along, but it's going a little too fast. Just giving a little bit more toning with the orange here. Okay, and uh, before we get any further, I'm going to throw some toning on the ground. I think I'll start with a raw umber. A little bit of shadow here. And this would be great to do in a sketchbook. I'm not using a sketchbook just because um, I would, if I had to turn the pages, they would get all smushy because they would be still wet. I'm going to grab some indigo and go over the raw, the raw umber. And that's doing this for two reasons. For one, indigo and the raw umber will make a nice natural shadow. But also having the indigo next to our orange pumpkins, even though it's going to be fairly grayed down in the shadow, will make the pumpkins seem a little bit brighter. Do we have any questions so far? Uh, we're caught up. <clears throat> oh, good. Okay. Now, when I'm working with watercolor crayons, I generally will choose a stiffer brush. So, um, like a, a golden tacklon. This is a Royal Magnical Aqualon. I like how the raw umber, you could use raw sienna even, and indigo will make like a nice almost like really muted teal color as i go under this uh, pumpkin with the ribs i am kind of curving my stroke so that i get that nice bright uh nice crisp contour and i'm just gonna fade it out these are all gonna be sketches today not really finished paintings so i just want you to kind of make sure your expectations are in line with what we're doing and after it's dry, you can overlay more if you want to put some hay in there or anything else. And now I'm going to go, I think I'll go to this one in the back. Sometimes it can be difficult to determine how vivid your colors are going to be. I tend not to use as much water with the cray with the pencils as I would with like watercolors because with a stiffer brush, um, I don't want to just wash out the pigment. If I use too much water, I would just kind of lift up the pigment and it would get sucked into my brush and it wouldn't move around on the paper. So by doing this, I can have just enough water to liquefy it and, but not so much that it wants to absorb onto my, onto my brush. It'll stay in the paper. Now I want that a little bit darker. So what I'm going to do is actually, I'm going to take some indigo and I'm going to use it. I'm going to use my brush to grab it up. I did make a big drop on my palette, on my paper, but I can blot that off of the rag. Throw some of that in the shadow area, um, kind of the shadow that these two pumpkins would be casting. Because remember, the light's coming from in front. Generally, usually, if you're taking a photograph or you're working from a photograph or something like this, the light is in front or behind the photographer. Grab some of this orange. And the other nice thing about working with watercolor pencils is that your water bucket stays very clear, very clean.
if you have some details that you want to put in there, you can draw directly on the pumpkin. But those won't be like uh, easily dissolvable, so just keep that in mind if you're going to do that. We'll do some of that in a minute. And I try to use as many of the colors uh, that I've already gotten out rather than grabbing new and it just helps everything kind of match and go together. Sarah, I think both our stomachs are <laughs> Yeah, <laughs> growling. I didn't have time to eat before I came over, so. Now, sometimes pumpkins will have um, uh, kind of like warts all over them, this texture, and you, this is great to do with your pencil um, right on the damp paper. And then you can use like a Q-tip or you can wrap a tissue or paper towel around your finger and just kind of dab out highlights and it works really, really well. I don't know if I, I don't think I have any Q-tips. Oh, I do have some Q-tips actually. But just make sure if you're gonna do the wartiness, do make sure you get a little bit of that texture on the contour of your uh, pumpkin. So that way you will have, it won't, it'll look like it goes all the way around and it'll help sell the idea that you've got a three dimensional uh, texture on the surface. Generally, I like to use a regular Q-tip, but I left those out of class. So I just have these cosmetic applicators, but I'm just gonna use the kind of the paddle side for my lifting. I'm working on the Aqua B paper that I recommend that you can get fairly inexpensively at um, at Amazon, like you get 50 sheets for about $15. And I actually got a, a pack of 25 at Consumer Crafts for $6 on sale. So that was even cheaper per sheet. I don't know how long that, it was on sale. I don't know how long the sale goes for, but um, but that was a, a good deal. Another thing I wanted to show you, which I, I did a short video of this, but I don't think I ever uploaded it. Um, I took an old palette, like a kid's kind of plastic palette. It came with a set and um, I sanded it with a piece of rough sandpaper and it made the perfect um, palette. So if I want to use my watercolor crayons or watercolor pencils or water soluble oil pastels, like a watercolor paint, all I have to do is scribble it on this palette and then I can pick it up with a wet brush. So this might, would be a nice way if, say you're, maybe you wanna go out painting somewhere but you don't want to carry your supplies, maybe you're worried about um, about losing them. Um, this is a great way you could you can carry yourself a little um, kind of to-go palette or just a great way to get a little more use out of your, out of your supplies because you can mix them just like your paints on your palette. And for just to shadow some of those little bumps, I'm just going underneath those little warty areas with a darker mix. Uh, Mary shows, if you use your wet brush to touch the pencil, do you need to let the pencil completely dry before using it directly on the paper again? You don't, but it will have a, um, it will go down darker because you're gonna be grabbing um, color that has been, uh, it's already been liquefied. I actually like my acrylic brushes a little bit better for watercolor pencils, so I jotted across the room and grabbed them. Um, yeah, just just don't sharpen your pencil while they're wet, and just when when they are wet, they will make a darker mark. But you can totally draw with them. Some people like to just so they can get that darker mark. You can experiment with them. There's really not much you're going to do that's going to hurt them, but just keep in mind that the lead is more fragile when it's wet. And I do have a video on watercolor pencil tech. I have a couple. I have watercolor pencil 101 that we live streamed last year or the year before. And that has a lot of information about different brands. And then I also have a tutorial of a cat in real time with watercolor pencils. And there's a lot of uh, tips and tricks in that video as well. So any of those would probably um, help you if you want to get some more ideas for your watercolor pencils. Okay, we're gonna let that one dry. And we'll go over to this one here with the ribs. And I'm just using this uh, little angled brush here. It's an acrylic painting brush. It doesn't hold a ton of water, 
and that's kind of why I like it for the pencils because uh, it's got a little stiffness to help push the pigment around. And you can do the same same things with whatever brush you have. Uh, just like I find that flats and angles work a little bit better than rounds as far as picking up pigment just because rounds hold more water. I think rounds have more bristles like for their size. quicker. All right, I'm going to go in with my um, orange and just give those ribs a little bit more shadow. This one in front, the, the two edges around this one in front are almost straight because we're facing them straight on. I like the yellows in the highlight areas. And now I'm going to grab some, let me just liquefy some of that, and then we're going to add a little bit of a green uh, texture to this, green pattern. So it'll be like a surface, it'll be a, a surface pattern that will have a little bit of a textured feel to it, but it's not an actual texture. It's more of just a, like a surface coloring. You can also scrub out your highlights really easily too. If you found you went a little too dark with a stiff brush, just give it a little scrub. And sometimes that's enough. Otherwise you can just blot it off with a towel if, uh, <clears throat> if it doesn't lighten it up enough for you. Because the, uh, the pigment, like the, the wax and watercolor pigment that's in the pencils, um, make it sit, make it kind of thicker and sit on top of your paper and not seep in. So you will have a little bit more control there. I can take this green and just add myself a little bit of a pattern or texture on this if I want to. I can dip it in the water and get a, get a more bold look. can add pattern wherever you'd like. But just remember when you're putting these spots on that the surface is curved. So you wouldn't want to just go scribble back and forth like that. You want to make sure that whatever you're doing kind of goes along the contour of the rib closest to it so that it looks like it's, it belongs where it is. Bonnie R, can you use a credit card scraper before you paint or should you do it when the paint is still wet? I would do it while the paint is still wet and you'll get the most dramatic results. If you do it before, you'll probably just dent the paper and a little bit of paint might settle into the scrapes, but that's about it. If you do it on the wet paper, you can see exactly where your scrape is going and um, it just is a little bit uh, easier to tell where, you know, where you're placing that effect. And I'm just going to liquefy this one and not really add um, the ribs to it just because this is just a smooth round one. You can also use the uh, back end of your aquarel brush and get a really pretty blend with these or any watercolor pencils or watercolor crayons. They're all very similar. All right, so there's some basic, just basic pumpkin sketches. And now we're going to move on to, let's do a, uh, a gooseneck gourd. We're gonna start with a green, green pencil. And I'm gonna start by putting in 
a circle and I am like drawing from my shoulder. I haven't set my pencil onto my paper yet. Once I feel like I've got it in the right place, about the right size, I'm gonna let my, my lead touch the touch the paper and I'm gonna keep going until I feel like I've got this the shape that I want, which is just kind of a slightly elongated circle. And then I'm gonna do another one over here. If you think about this swan neck, think about this being the swan's like shoulder and chest and think about this being its head. Okay, and then we're gonna connect. Connect it with a curvy line. And then another one. a little bit flatter at the bottom, but it should have a curved line. Kind of like the bottom of a jar. And it's going to have a little, like its stem is going to kind of curve around like this. And you can see why they call it a swan neck. And then its little stem would come off like that from the tip of the gourd. I'm feeling like I would like this to be a little bit bigger now that I see it. I have no plans on framing these, so I can pull that sketch right down to the bottom of my paper. Now, something that would be kind of cool, because usually your, uh, well, these can have patterns on it. They can be all one color. Uh, they could, they dry out to like a, um, a tan color. Uh, but I want to have some white pattern on there. So I think the easiest way to do that is to grab a piece of wax, which I should have a hunk of wax right here. And I'm going to make some uh, pattern on here. And I am just going to kind of make little dashes. Um, they're kind of like a curved line going around the circumference or curved dashes going around the circumference of the... Uh, gourd and it can be difficult to see I wonder if I tip it you might be able to see I don't know it's pretty tough to see well you'll see when I add uh, when I add some paint and I'm gonna go ahead and grab my palette again and I am just gonna scribble out loads of that green and then a little bit of a lighter green and a yellow uh, Savina Art have you ever tried the render no show true sketchbooks? Yes, I just did a um, I did a sketchbook Sunday the other uh, about two weeks ago, and I did a grapefruit slice, and I really liked it, which was funny because I reviewed that book when I first got it, and I wasn't crazy about it. I I found it really difficult to blend on. But what I realized was that with uh, alcohol pens, you can layer on it really well. I haven't used it with watercolor or water media, but um, but I absolutely loved it. And once I figured that out, I don't know if I have that one down here or if I moved it upstairs. I don't see it right off the right off the. So they can look in the archive, your video yes, archive, yes. and find it. Absolutely. Yep. All right. So I've got four colors here. In fact, I'm just going to scoot that over, and I can have it in shot there. And I'm going to go back to that big brush. The uh, It's about half an inch flat, I'd say. And I'm going to start off with my darker color. I'm going to add it with um, uh, side to side strokes, horizontal strokes. Oh, I need, that. I need that to be a little bit darker and cooler. So I'm going to grab some indigo. I'm going to add that right to the bottom. And you can start to see some of my lines resisting. Like right there, you can see a couple like waxy lines poking through. I'm just being careful to keep my edges nice and smooth. I wish I had picked up some gourds. I went to Trilogy Farms last week and I... And they had so many, but I didn't see any prices, and um, I figured they're probably pretty expensive because usually yes. stuff is kind of expensive over there. So I'm it like, is. I'll just wait for the grocery store. 
grocery store, you get those mesh bags that are full of yeah different mm -hmm. gourds. Sometimes you can get them to like the Christmas tree shop. Really? Yeah, they're not, they're not necessarily the real ones, but you can get they they look real. Really? Yeah, oh, that would they be have handy. all their fall stuff out. That would be really handy because I don't know how many times I bought gourds to do like sketching down at the library with the kids and. You know, I just, I decorate with them afterwards, so it was no right. big deal, but boy, I, I probably would use reusable ones. And I think AC Moore has had them in the past, too, like in their fall oh, decor. Because yeah? I've gotten, um, I always fill a dish with, you know, some fake pumpkins yeah. and stuff like that. Because I hate buying the real ones and then tossing them, which is kind of a waste. Yeah, at least they're but biodegradable. If I, I, mean, if I had a compost pile, I wouldn't mind so much, but I don't, so... Yeah. We have a compost. If you need any compost, our compost tumbler is full. Is it? It is, yeah. Unfortunately, I've got a black thumb, so I won't be using it. I think you put it on your front, the gardens in the front of the house. Oh, yeah, I guess so. That's not going to hurt the mulch? To put compost um, over the mulch? Well, you probably want to rake the mulch out of the way. Put the compost on and then rake the mulch back over. Oh. Like Lindsay's like, project. already too many steps. Yep, way too many steps. <laughs> I know I'll watch some cooking videos on YouTube sometimes, and I'm like, yeah, you lost me at dirtying two pots. That's not going to happen. I made apple butter in the crock pot. Boy, that smelled good. I bet. I really like the watercolory look here, especially like in the neck where the bloom kind of pushed the... Um, the pigment out so you know you do have that versatility with your pencils and of course you could do this with you could sketch with a pencil and do your watercolor if you don't have this so don't feel like you're missing out if you if you don't have them uh michelle fair have you ever used paul rubens 100 percent cotton watercolor paper no i haven't i didn't know there was a rubens watercolor paper i wonder who makes it is that a, it might be a Hanna Mule product because they have a lot of their, their papers are named after like Van Gogh and Cezanne and, and uh, what have you, different Turner and. Look at a Salvador Dali paper. You paint one thing and then it turns into something else. It melts. <laughs> yeah, it melts. <laughs> be awesome. Clock appears. And that's pretty much all I'm going to do for that because we've got a couple highlight spots. Of course, you could go in and you could add more, but when you have a gourd that's got a smooth texture, there's really not much to add because you've just got to get that color in there. Um, there's not a lot of shading and whatnot to do with something with a with a smooth texture. But, um, but of course, put as much or as little time in as you want, as you feel comfortable to. And that would be a gooseneck or swan neck gourd. Okay, the next one I want to do is um, called a, it's a, it has a couple names. It's called a patty pan or a pancake or a scallop. I don't know if you've seen those. They're kind of flat. They look almost um, like little pillows, like a throw pillow. And let's do that. They're usually pretty light, um, but I'll have to do a dark background, I think, and leave the, leave the pumpkin kind of the squash kind of light. So we're going to start with a saucery, it's like a disc kind of, so I'm going to start with an oval. And I'm going to do one upside down and one right side up. Or one stem up and one stem, stem down, I guess is the, what I mean. Uh, Lucy Tyson, where can we obtain the Hannah Mule expression block you use in your floral class? Um, that, let's see, uh, you can go to the Hannah Mule website and there's probably a store locator on there. Um, just search Hannah Mule and there should be, you should be able to, to search the website. Um, Amazon sometimes has it, but I got to tell you, Amazon is expensive on that. That paper is expensive on Amazon. Um, I think it's a really good deal if you're in the UK and you have some stores that stock it because it seems to be one of those papers that's very reasonable in the UK. Um, so I would just do a Google search. I don't have, I got mine directly from Henna Mule, so... I don't, I don't think they sell on their website though. I think they 
they uh, wholesale to shops. So that's where that's where I would go and, and look for a uh, kind of where to buy section. Okay, so I put a little stem here in the center of the one that's stem up. Over here in this one, I've got uh, just kind of like a little indent in the middle. And you're going to kind of want to kind of draw almost like a ruffle around the edge. Keep your line, your, your, your mark soft. You don't want any sharp corners here. It really does look like a throw pillow. And very, very slight ribbing. And it's going to curve from the center out to the side gently. And it's going to go, the lines are going to go from the center kind of to like any, any indents that you've put on the outside. I feel like there should be one there. And then here, we're just going to do the, um, we're not going to see this ridge so much, so we're just going to kind of shape our the edge of the squash so that we've got a little bit of a little bit of a bump, but pretty much do that right on the line where you made it, that you originally drew. I mean, now I do want to show a little kind of a double line here. I just want to show like the contour of the bottom of the squash because that's where the that part up here, this puffy part, that's underneath on that one. So I want to show that. You're just going to have the faintest bit of ribbing, ribbing coming up from the edges here. You're not going to see as much as you do there. And I am going to tone this with just a really light green. Super, super light. You could even do like a gray or a yellow ochre. Just something very pale. I don't think I'll throw the background in, but that'd be something you could do with ink just to make it stand out because it is going to be pretty light. And I think I actually might see if I have a gray. I think I might use gray on this one just for simplicity's sake. Um, so I'm going to start up here with this shadow. I'm just going to bring a line across right in the, the um, kind of the, uh, the indent. And I'm going to bring that shadow around like that and color in the crescent shadow here. Then on this side, I'm going to outline the dent, but the shadow is going to go up on the, um, on those kind of like ruffles. And we're just going to lightly color that in. Over here, our shadow is going to be on the bottom. That double line that I had you draw to show the um, the volume at the bottom of the squash. And then we'll just do a little bit underneath this uh, squash that's on top just to show a little bit of a cast shadow there. And we could bring a little bit of shadow just gently, not as hard. We don't want the hard line that we have there because we don't have that groove on the top side. So we're just going to very gently do a little shadow just to uh, show some volume. We do a little bit over here, but nothing, uh, nothing really dark. And then the edges here, we want a little shadow on the edges because we wanted to show that how the thickness of it and the shading is what gives you the volume and the weight. So that's where we want to get that little bit of shadow just on the edges and they're going to be soft and um, and kind of thick to make it feel like it's kind of rounding over and you've got this kind of face, the side of the scallop or ruffle that is, um, it's darker and a little bit on that edge right there. All right, I'm going to go in with my half inch brush. You don't have to use a brush as big, but it's just going to help me for time's sake. I'm going to wet all of the brighter areas first. So the raw sienna or raw umber and the green are just kind of making almost like a cream color. I like to do all the lights first, and then while it's still wet, I will wet the shadows and blend them in.
How's everyone doing in the chat? Good. All right, so I'm going to stay on this pumpkin, the same one, or the gourd rather, and now I'm going to start blending in my darker color. I'm sticking with the same brush. I'm just having the tip of my brush, uh, the angle tip, more of the shadow edge so that I can kind of control where that's going a little bit better. If your brush starts to spread apart like that, you can see the bristles, how they're just kind of like uh, kind of frayed, you need to re-wet because you're not gonna have any control if, you, if your brush is that uh, dry. This would be really fun to do with pencil because it is a really light color so you could uh, you could get all of your ranges very easily all your tones with a pencil I'm gonna grab some gray on my palette so I can put some in I felt like I was washing away the gray a little bit more than I was spreading it sometimes that happens especially with your lighter colors I can put that in wet into wet and get that nice soft blend. Almost just kind of drop it in. So if your drawings ever look flat, you probably need some shading to give you the volume that you're that you require. Okay, we'll do the same over here, liquefy the lights. And there's just a little bit of highlight on this little part that sticks out, the little edge of the scallop ruffle there. And we'll liquefy the shadows. Also, um, you can kind of control where everything stays a little bit easier with the watercolor pencils because the pigment itself is a little bit heavier. So it's not going to rush away on you as easily. And let me grab a little bit more gray on my palette. add any of those greens in there if you wanted to and just kind of throw in those soft shadows I like that with just that little touch of green that I picked up in my palette I think that really looks nice and you can throw in the ribbing with your brush it'll be nice and soft because everything's still wet Grab a little bit of that uh, indigo and green for over here too, because I like the way that looks. So that's a really pale one. I should have gone with a, a darker squash. And then the, the stems are actually fairly vibrant on this, so. I'm going to go with this nice uh, kind of apple green color. It's almost like a chartreuse for the stem here. And the little stump there will just be our burnt sienna, uh, raw sienna or raw umber. It almost looks like a pie. And you can do a little bit of texture on the wet stump with your crayons or pencils. Okay, and of course you will probably want a darker background to make that show up a little bit better, but that is the patty pan squash. The next one we're gonna do is probably one of my favorites and there's a couple that have this uh, same shape. Um, it's been called a turban or even, uh, I think it's a butternut squash will have that same kind of like, uh, kind of, I don't know, almost looks like the squash is a butt, mm -hmm. <laughs> you know? Um, so we're gonna start by doing a, kind of like a uh, 
one fairly big egg shaped oval and then we're going to do a circle kind of overlapping that the turban ones are more uh, more pronounced but you'll see what i mean like if you look at the bottom of like a um as a buttercup one has a long one's a long i think the butternut one is long and light and the yeah butter look, cup either is, way i remember butternut looks more like a peanut oh yeah it's kind of yeah, yeah. And the buttercup is it's round, and then you have like a circle on the bottom, yeah. but almost like another squash is trying to grow out of it yes. type of type of look. And the turban is is similar; it's just a little bit more pronounced. So we've got this almost looks like a upside down Mario mushroom. So this is the bottom of the squash. This little bottom stump there, and. This bottom part is going to have some kind of like bulbous sections. It's like the ribs on a pumpkin, but they're just really, really, um, really pronounced, really bubbly. And then you have kind of a, um, this like divide between the two parts of the squash. I'm just doing that in my raw umber. And then you've got this puffy kind of top that looks like the turban. And this is also going to have a little bit of ribbing to it. So this is, has so much volume, it's really fun to draw. And then its stem would generally be coming out from it, the opposite of that, be coming out from the top. But sometimes you could see it kind of sticking down like that. Generally, you see these lying on their top with the stem down because the uh, the bottoms are so rolly that they won't stay they won't stay put otherwise. And the colors on this, you can have usually you've got some striation. You've got some like kind of like a hunter green, but notice that the way you want to put your color in, you want them to go with the ribs. So it's going from kind of like out from either the stem or out from the bottom stump, following the same path. If you think of a globe, how you have the latitude and longitude lines, that's kind of how you want to put in your coloring on the squash. And then you can have like a rim of this kind of around where the smaller squash bubble comes out of the bigger squash bubble. And there again, you can have a kind of this like uh, this kind of dividing color, but the color can also spill down the edge in that same, in the same parallel lines as the ribs. And if you want, you can use your wax and get some lighter um, some lighter streaks. Just re remember to keep that same pattern. Keep the lines going parallel with the ribs. Do some of this darker red along the edges. It's going to help give you volume when you have these the edges that are a little bit darker. And I'll do the brighter orange in the middle. And then our white is is already preserved with our uh, with our wax. I can feel where the wax is when I'm coloring with this. It's kind of neat, neat. finish by filling in with your orange and then we're going to liquefy it. Don't be shy with the color here because these are really um, intensely colored. Just try to keep like a channel of a light kind of ochre color between the two um, portions of squash and that will help give them give it some form. Also 
also throw in a little bit of yellow, nice warm yellow, in some of the over top some of the oranges to just brighten them up and give them a little bit of warmth. Okay, I think I want this a little bit darker in there too. All right, now go in with your big brush because we've pretty much done all the work. We just need to uh, liquefy. Just be careful not to go over the green when you're liquefying the orange. You're going to end up with mud. A little bit of earthiness is fine, but you don't want to lose all that vibrancy. It'd be nice to get a hold of some heirloom tomatoes, too. Those, are, mm. those would be really pretty to... And delicious. Yes. Yeah, my mother. Salt. Yeah. Mm. Or a little balsamic vinegar. Yes, definitely. With uh, some uh, mozzarella and some basil. And basil. You wouldn't eat the mozzarella, but. No, but I like the basil and I like tomatoes. Well, it's funny because Lila never thought she liked tomatoes, and my mother had grown some, or my sister, one of them had grown, grown some, and my mother made her a sandwich. Uh, just a tomato lettuce and cheese sandwich with mayonnaise. Mm. And she's like, I had the best sandwich ever at Grammy's. That sounds delicious. There's a farm somewhere in Maine that grows the greenhouse tomatoes that Hannaford does carry for most of the year. Yeah. And those are pretty good. Are but those the vine ones? Because that's yes. usually what I get. Yep. Hothouse vine. So those ones are usually pretty good. I But I also try not to eat tomatoes because they're um, in the nightshade family, which um. can... Be bad for um, inflammation. Oh, that's a which bummer. Which is sad. because yeah. <laughs> I really, really like tomatoes, but I I like those ones that are almost they're like a purpley blackish oh, brown yeah, those color. Are really good too. They don't keep very long, but they're no, but they are they're delicious. really good. And you can let that dry and add more shading and add like layer on some more color if you want. I'm gonna tip it because I think some of the you're getting some high. Um, it's looking lighter where it's not really light. Uh, but that's the basic shape. You've got this bubble here, and you got this big shape underneath. Um, so it's very textured, really fun, and they've got the basics of how to draw them. So if you are, you know, if you find some gourds and you want to sketch them, you've got a good place to start. And another decorative gourd we see a lot is kind of like a pear-shaped gourd, and they can have some neat texture on them. They can be smooth, or they can have um, kind of big warts on them, and you'll see a lot of gourds in this with this particular shape so this will be a fun one to sketch i think um they can be sometimes you'll see them and they'll be like half half green and half yellow so i'll sketch one of those really quick actually i'm going to turn my paper this way so i can fit a couple on there i've got i've got something on my fingers so well <laughs> so in it the bottoms are very round they're almost like a perfect circle on the bottom and then you can draw another circle on the top if that helps you get the rounded shoulders right and then you just connect the two uh angel servina can you use any kind of soap to clean your animal hair watercolor brushes um i would use I, well, I usually just rinse them with water, but then I'll, if I need more than that, I'll just use a mild um, a mild dish soap or a mild brush cleaner or even baby shampoo. You really don't need much to clean watercolor out. Watercolor is very, um, very benign. I'm just shading that with yellow, and then I'm just going to put it, and it almost looks like these things are dipped in paint. They're so smooth. Like the line dividing the green from the yellow is so smooth they look almost painted. And it kind of looks like a light bulb. Uh, Mary Magoo, the wax you're using is paraffin, not beeswax. You can use either, but the, yeah, that happens to be just hunga canning wax that I had left over from another project. You can also get white wax crayons or clear wax crayons. White crayons work fine from like um, a box of crayons, but you can get clear ones that are just the wax. There's no white pigment in them. Um, Sushi, we make some. You can find them on Amazon or any any online art supplier that sells her products. I think Martin Weber distributes her stuff, so she should be, it should be, fine, be able to be found most places. And you might have a stem and you might not. Usually they, those get picked off pretty easily. 
and that's all I would do for those and those are very plentiful and you can have little white spots on them or little streaks so you can go ahead and add as much detail to those as you want but I would try to get my hands on one that way you can really examine it and I would do a little bit of shading around the edge uh, just to give it a little bit of depth but let me get this green part painted in first you can see like if we, this was watercolor the green and the yellow would just be whooshing into one another just have a little bit more that's why I chose the watercolor crayon uh, pencils because I know I'd be able to get through quite a bit more I'm just gonna pick up some shadow color from my palette I had green on my brush so I'm picking up some kind of rusty brownish reds and I should be able to just go ahead and add that to my edges here just to give it a little bit of shadow So it's pretty much like a pear, just different coloring. And, um, but you can also find these, this shaped gourd with a lot of texture on it, which is also a lot of fun to sketch. Again, we're gonna start off with our, our circle. And this time, let's kind of put like a rounded circle on top. So we have more of a rustic uh, shape to start off with, less, less perfect, less smooth. A little bit less of a difference between the bottom and the top and we can put it on a nice big hook stem Get some texture just by scribbling linear lines along the along the stem and then we're gonna take the take a nice light yellow ochre or Naples yellow something light and we're gonna draw some ribs down it just having those lines I think help help it make make it feel three-dimensional any questions on this shape Sarah we're caught up people are just actually talking mostly about squash and the types of squash oh yeah <laughs> <laughs> Stuff like that. My sister gave me a squash, a butternut squash. Mm, to I do love cook. squash. Can you eat squash? Like, is that okay for you? Yeah, it's just, I, I mean, I don't not eat tomatoes. I just have cut down on them. Yeah. More, because I used to eat them. You know, I would just buy a bag of tomatoes and slice a couple up and mm -hmm. sit down, and I don't do that anymore. Oh, and a nice, rich, buttery yellow. Thankfully, greens are great, which, and I love green veggies a lot, so. Good. But no, squash is good for you, and I eat that, you know, mm -hmm. fre not frequently, but whenever I'm in the mood, I'll get some squash and cook it up. All right, so there's a basic color, and we're going to get uh, light yellow and dark yellow. And now I'm going to use the raw sienna because that's a uh, raw umber. That's the darkest color we've used so far. And we're going to put in some uh, pretty substantial peanut shapes, kind of. Um, and they're going to grow in the pattern that we, where we kind of sketched. So they kind of grow in lines. So if I've got one here, there's going to be a bunch of them that are just kind of growing all together but they're they're also following the contour of the um, of the ribs that we sketched in and you're also going to have the edges of your um, your gourd is going to be disrupted by these warts So it's really fun, a really good way to add the texture in. But just keep in mind, for some reason on these, they tend to grow like in, they like to stay on top of each other, like in a line. Now 
going to go and apply my first wash. I'm just going to liquefy everything, but I want to make sure that I don't lose all those lines, so I'm going kind of around the warty areas. And that's going to make the warts appear lighter and make everything else seem a little bit more vibrant. You can go ahead and get the stem done as well, but you might want to switch to a brush that's a little bit nimbler. And while the stem's wet, I recommend grabbing um, a firm pencil and just kind of scraping in, or drawing in some lines. They'll be dark because they're going to grab the lead of the watercolor pencil. And you can also grab a credit card scraper or the back handle of your aquarelle brush and scrape in that texture as well. Because then you'll have an actual texture on the surface of the paper and that will um, that'll work out really well. Okay, so now grab like a round brush or something just that you can get in that's kind of small and a rag. And then as you liquefy, you can pull up some of the color and you can blot it on your rag. Or if you have too much color in there, you can actually go in and you can, um, you can blot it. Uh, Penny Cormier, what stamping ink is best to watercolor over, and can you recommend a cheap paper to use to make cards for a class? If you want watercolor paper to make cards, um, Fabriano Studio, uh, there you can get them, you can get 140 pound in 50 packs for, um, I think for about $20 you can get the 9x12 and you can cut that in half to make cards. Um, and you can get that in hot press, which is good for stamping. So if you're going to stamp and then have them watercolor, that's what I would recommend. And for an ink, there's a few good ones. I like Ranger Archival. Um, Versifying Claire is also really good for watercoloring. I've heard the Gina K Anaglam ink is good for um, watercoloring and Copics. But whatever you get, I would recommend getting a reinker as well because uh, once you're stamping a lot, you might need to reink. Like when I prepare for a class, I always have to reink my ink pads when I'm either before I start or when I'm done. And that will save you a lot of money in the future from buying new ink pads when that runs out because usually a bottle of reinker will reink your pad like seven times. So it's like getting seven ink pads for the price of one extra ink pad because usually a bottle of reinker costs about as much as a an ink pad would. And I'm going to grab some of that warmer yellow color and add that underneath some of the warts in that where I have the darker yellow strips. I also find VersaFine Claire and um, Archival to be the same, the same quality, so get whatever is a better value for you. And I won't need to do anything on the lighter um, stripes because they're just, they just turned out to be about the right color just on their own. And hopefully, um, now that we're nearing the end of this demonstration, you can kind of see how just having those um, kind of like uh, latitude lines and longitude lines on your on your squash really do give it a nice um, a kind of a nice sense of like depth and roundness. I'm gonna grab a little bit of purple and use that just for a little bit of shading and a little contrast. Grabbing an opposite color is always a wonderful way uh, to shadow or to make colors pop.
You can use any type of plastic for a palette. You could even take um, old packaging and just sand it so it will have some tooth. You could cut up a milk container, like a milk, plastic milk crate. No, what do you call it? Milk bottle? Carton? What do you call the things milk comes in? Milk bottle? Carton. Carton. Milk, I... The plastic ones, because it's already got that haziness to it. It's already got a little texture. You could cut a square of that and use that. That would work really well. Words are escaping me today. <laughs> I didn't plan anything too complicated mm -hmm. <laughs> that needed a lot of explanation. Do we have any shape? I think other than this, maybe We're we'll do. Caught up for the moment. Okay, oh, I'll do an acorn. That's one of the, the one last shape that I wanted to show. So those are kind of our pear-shaped squashes. You'll see a lot of gourds that are pear-shaped. And you can mix and match the shapes to make the pumpkin or the gourd that you're trying to make as well. All right, so an acorn will be the last one that we're going to do. And I think I'll use this nice dark green. Um, this time, I don't think I'm going to start with a circle. I'm just going to start with kind of like a curved line, kind of like a half a heart. And then we'll do another half a heart. but it's, you just want to make sure it's not too pointy. A little stump on there. And then again, the acorns generally do have rib ribbing. So remember, your ribs are going to follow. They're going to be influenced by the edge. So the closer they are to the edge, the more they're going to be rounded as they come towards the center. The less they're going to be rounded, they'll be more straight because you're looking straight at them. And that's pretty much all there is to drawing an acorn squash. And those come in a variety of colors. You can see those in, generally we see them in like this hunter green color, but they can be found in cream and orange as well. And a great resource, if you want to do some sketching, is to go online and search for free seed catalogs. And you can either request seed catalogs to be mailed to you. However, most seed companies have downloadable PDF catalogs for free. And you'll actually be able to see the detail better on your computer screen than you will on like the, the printed versions, because the printed versions are on a very thin, news printy kind of like sail flyer yeah. material. Uh, so you're gonna be able to see much better on your computer screen than, um, and if you requested the catalog and also you're saving paper. So uh, that's what I'd recommend doing. Um, we'll take a quick look at the, because we pretty much color this anyway, the same way we did everything else. Um, so we'll take a quick look at the different examples that we did. We did pumpkins. They can be squat. They can have really textured ribs where if like you were to run your finger across it, it'd be like a xylophone. Uh, they can be smooth and they can also have bumps on them. Uh, like the gourd that we just did with all the warts. So pumpkins come in a variety of different shapes, colors, and sizes. Um, we also did our gooseneck gourd. So you can find a lot of gooseneck and swan neck gourds like that. Um, they can be a variety of colors. It can be yellow, cream, tan. If they're dried, they're usually tan. Um, you could also do a birdhouse gourd. Sometimes you'll see them and they'll literally look like a figure eight kind of. You'll have, you'll have a bulbous bottom and then a top and that's how they look they look like a snowman kind of and you're gonna draw them the same way it doesn't matter what kind of gourd you find you're gonna draw them the same way with circles and half hearts and shapes like that just look for the different common denominators and you can draw it we also have our turban that looks like a turban and you'll have different squashes that will have that same quality you've got the flat pancake ones but hopefully you can see the how they are related so that you can sketch whatever ones you want to sketch. You have any questions before we go? We're caught up. All right, wonderful. Well, thank you guys so much for stopping by. I know this was kind of a strange live Friday. We we're just kind of sketching um, one subject type of thing, but I hope you enjoyed it. And I hope you leave a thumbs up before you go because it does help um, my channel get discovered. And um, it's very encouraging to, when people come to the live streams. <laughs> I'm not just talking to myself. 
Uh, do you have anything to add, Sarah? No, I don't. All right. Thank you so much, guys. And we'll see you next Friday. Happy crafting.